great, thanks very much. And uh, thanks for the, the invitation to speak here again. Um, I have given variants of this talk a couple of times before. Uh, so if you are one of the people that have suffered through something like this before, I, I hereby swear this is the last time that I speak about this material. Um, it, the paper associated to it is now on the archive. So if there's anything in here that sort of piques your interest, you can, uh, you can go and take a look. Um, I want to begin, so this is going to be joint work with um, uh, Julian Lychek, uh, postdoc, a former postdoc here, uh, who's now in uh, Bath, Roman Sarapin, who was uh, an, an intern uh, at IST for a while, and Arnesh Mates in Leuven. Um, and I want to go back and talk about where this, this problem comes from uh, before I uh, pause and, and, and speak a little bit about some basic civ problems. And then I'm going to return to the problem and motivate it a bit more and uh, ultimately end up um, uh, explaining um, some of the new conjectures that we've uh, we've been developing. Um, uh, sorry. Yeah, so this problem really goes back to uh, this very influential AIM meeting in 2002. I think it's the only AIM meeting that took place over two weeks. Uh, it was about rational points. Uh, it had lots of uh, motivating open problems. And in particular, there was this survey written by uh, the late great Peter Swinnerton Dyer. Uh, he had a, a Hilbertian list of 23 open problems that he presented. Um, and this was problem 21. And uh, sort of motivated by the Manning's conjecture, which is about counting rational points of bounded height, he phrased this question. So you, you suppose that you have a variety which has a map down to P1. Uh, whose fibers are all conics, and you just try and count the number of points in P1 of bounded height, number of rational points uh, in P1 of bounded height, such that the fiber uh, has rational points. Um, and he asks, you know, what can you say about this counting function? Uh, can, you, can you actually prove anything about this counting function? And in fact, can you do something similar if instead of asking about fibers that are conics, you have fibers that are um, uh, curves of genus one? Um, so uh, we're going to address this question in this talk, uh, but we're going to tackle a slightly easier question, or much easier question, where we sort of switch out uh, the phrase containing rational points in the fiber for containing p-adic points in the fiber. And uh, I think both, both questions are interesting, uh, but Peter's question is a lot harder. So before getting on to that, uh, but that's, that's where we're going, but um, let me... Uh, just go over a couple of sieve problems, uh, which are quite classical. So uh, if we're given a polynomial uh, with integer coefficients and two, uh, two variables, you know, one of the basic proto sieve questions one could ask is, um, you know, can you show that this polynomial takes infinitely many prime values? And, and can you give an estimate for how often it takes a prime value? Um, a variant of this question uh, which will be more relevant in this talk, is, uh, is to try and ask instead that your, your polynomial um, is only divisible by primes that lie in some predetermined set of rational primes. So that the set of rational primes that crops up here are these kind of Frobenian sets of primes. So these are just primes uh, such that uh, their uh, they're, they're Frobenius conjugacy class lies in some determined union of conjugacy classes uh, of the Galois group under some extension. Anyway, some set of primes uh, coming from algebraic number theory. And so can you, um, so yeah, what the, uh, I'd, I'd say that traditionally SID methods have focused very much on question one, and there's a lot of uh, you know, very substantial and important work on that. Uh, but one of the goals of this talk is to give a bit of agency to this second question, because that's what happens to come up in this application. So let me just state it again. Um, you know, if can you can you get an asymptotic formula or estimates for the number of times, sorry, the number of pairs of integers m and n, uh, whose absolute value is bounded by t, and for which this polynomial <clears throat> is only divisible by primes lying in this uh, uh, this Frobenian set of primes. And actually, the, the particular set of primes that we'll care about um, are just the set of unramified primes that split in some uh, some fixed uh, extension number field. 
Uh, so let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, so here's, uh, here's a, a theorem that will, uh, will permeate this talk, actually. Um, it's a, a result of Landau from 1908. I'm sure you must have, many of you have heard of this before. And it pertains to the uh, univariate polynomial, f of x, y is equal to y. And we're going to take k to be the Gaussians. So the primes, this is a Galois extension, and the primes that split in this uh, quadratic extension are just the primes congruent to 1 mod 4. And uh, so the second question on the, the previous slide is just asking about the number of integers uh, which are only uh, divisible by primes congruent to 1 mod 4. And his uh, sort of complex analytic argument tells you that 0% uh, yeah, of them are, are, are of this shape. And in fact, uh, you get an asymptotic formula of the shape t divided by square root log t. Um, uh, also, uh, I should maybe also reflect on question one. So here, question one is just the prime number theorem. <clears throat> Here's a second example um, found in the uh, Opera de Cribro book uh, by Friedlander and the Banyets. So we're taking a more complicated polynomial this time. F of x, y is equal to x to the six plus y squared. And we're gonna take k to be a, <clears throat> a Galois cubic extension. And then we're asking about uh, you know, how often you get these integers m and n, uh, such that m to the six plus n squared is less than or equal to t, and such that this polynomial is only uh, divisible by primes that split in this, uh, in this cyclic cubic extension. I think um, getting an asymptotic formula is still out of reach uh, for this problem, but um, we do have upper and lower bounds. And that's what's uh, carried out using the um, <clears throat> the beta sieve uh, in this uh, in this book, and um, you get an asymptotic formula of the shape t t to the two thirds uh, divided by log t to the two thirds. So yeah, question two has some sort of resolution uh, for this particular scenario. Um, however, I should point out that the the corresponding question one is completely wide open. So I guess. Um, from the point of view of sieves, I'm, I'm trying to promote the idea of question two, and here I'm showing you that it should be easier in general. Um, I mean, it soon becomes difficult though, so I think this, isn't, this, is, this would be interesting and useful, uh, but I, I don't know how to do it. So can you, can you handle this same problem uh, for, uh, for cubic extensions which aren't cyclic? That's one question. Uh, a second question, so if you, if you picked uh, any binary quadratic form Q, um, for which K and, uh, sorry, for which little K and for which uh, number fields big K, can you handle question two for these kind of special polynomials, which are Q of X to the K comma Y? Okay, so those are my sieve theory uh, questions. Um, and I'd like to go on to uh, say a bit about um, this question of local solubility. And yeah, the goal is basically, if you're given a family of Diophantine equations, whatever that means, uh, can we say something about the probability that an element of that family is soluble over every p-adic field? Okay, so this is not a, an entirely new subject. Um, and want to motivate it by this, uh, uh, this I think, very attractive example. Um, so you take the family of diagonal conics, and so they're parameterized by these three coefficients, ax squared plus by squared plus cz squared equal to zero. And we just take all of these diagonal conics, we order them by height, um, so a, b, and c run over integers. So we have a very nice criterion here for when this uh, conic has a uh, a point everywhere locally. Um, and in fact, actually here, because of the Hassel principle, that's equivalent to having a rational point. And that condition for p-adic solubility, at least at an odd prime, is just that any of the primes, yeah, for any of the primes dividing A, uh, the corresponding Legendre symbol minus BC over P uh, should be one. And similarly for the other two coefficients. <clears throat> So yeah, it's a very simple criterion. 
And you can use that uh, to get an upper bound for this uh, density of conics, which have, uh, have points everywhere locally. And this was done by, um, uh, by Serre in 1990. And so he counted the number of primitive triple vectors, uh, uh, primitive triples of integers, ABC, uh, which are bounded in modulus by B and uh, have this property that the, the corresponding conic has p-adic points everywhere. And so he was able to show that you that actually 0% of these uh, are everywhere locally soluble. And he was able to make that 0% very precise in the sense that uh, it grows at worst like uh, b cubed divided by log b uh, to the 3 over 2. OK, so he proved this uh, using the large sieve in 1990. And in fact, you get a similar result if instead of just fixing, uh, sorry, just uh, just studying diagonal conics, if you looked at the full family of conics with five uh, coefficients, um, you get the same kind of result, but with a different power of log b, but still a, a negative power of log b. However, it becomes different if you look at, um, instead of the family of plane conics, you look at the family of plane cubics, um, you get different behavior. So this is now, uh, you have 10, 10 coefficients defining your uh, ternary cubic form and you order them all by height. And then recently, um, Bhargava, Cremona and Fisher were able to show that um, a positive proportion of these plane cubics defined over the rational numbers uh, have local points everywhere. And in fact, um, they were able to pin down that positive proportion. So I, I should say actually that uh, the fact that a positive proportion of these plane cubics are everywhere locally soluble goes back to earlier work of Poonen and, uh, and Boloch in 2002 uh, as part of a, a more general discussion of hypersurfaces. Um, but the, yeah, the main thrust of this paper is to really work out what that constant is. Um, and it happens to have this, uh, Euler product, so in, in, it's kind of nice that you um, you get the same Euler factor for every prime p. And uh, essentially, what this is saying is that you know ninety seven percent of uh, plane cubics, when ordered by height, uh, are everywhere locally soluble. So what's it's kind of interesting. What's going on here? Why are we getting a positive proportion here, uh, and yet for the family of all conics, we're getting zero percent. Um, so this talk is really uh, going to be uh, driven by uh, families of equations over the projective line. So it's very interesting to ask about higher dimensional bases, and I'll, I will touch on that, but most of the, the motivation is around um, families of Diophantine equations over P1. Uh, so we saw, we've not seen any examples of, of that before. So in Serre's result, uh, everything was parameterized by P2. And in the Bhargava Cremona Fisher paper, it was parameterized by P9. So this is an example of, uh, I guess, a threefold, which uh, uh, naturally has a vibration over P1. And I'm, I'm just calling these Landau threefolds for the purpose of this talk. Um, uh, you can sort of see that they have the same uh, sort of structure as the, the sort of basic uh, problem that was considered by Landau. So I'll, I'll return to this example. Let me um, introduce a tiny bit of notation. So in this talk, uh, rather than writing all of these things out every time, um, by using the word standard vibration, I'm just going to mean a dominant morphism from X to P1. And I'm going to assume that X is smooth, it's projective, it's geometrically irreducible, and it's a variety defined over the rational numbers. And I'm always going to assume that uh, uh, the fiber above a generic point is you know, absolutely irreducible. So that's going to be my, my setup throughout the talk. And for these, uh, the counting function that I'm going to be interested in is, is this. So we are counting points in the projective line, rational points in the projective line, which have height at most b. And so the height here is just the, the naive standard height on, on p1, where you, you just take the maximum of the components after you've uh, taken uh, primitive 
pairs of integers as, as, as representative coordinates. And the, the key thing is that we want uh, only those rational points which lie in the image of the adelic points of X. So that's completely equivalent to just asking about the rational points in P1 uh, above uh, for which the fiber above it, above them um, has points everywhere locally. So it's, it's exactly that kind of counting function that, uh, that, that Swinnerton Dyer uh, was discussing at the start of the talk, except that we are asking only about local solubility everywhere rather than uh, global solubility. Um, good. So uh, we could think about this counting function again in, in the context of this, uh, the, these Landau threefolds. So we know that S, for example, so S and T are co-prime integers in that example at the top of the screen. And we require S to be a, a sum of two squares. So um, you know, any odd primes dividing S have to be uh, congruent to one mod four. And similarly for T, um, so, uh, we essentially have like a, a, an application of Landau's result um, will give us that the, for this particular family, this counting function should grow like B squared divided by log B. So that's the, the example that I want to just mention here. And um, sort of motivated by, I guess, Sayre's example and uh, these kind of Landau type constructions um, there was a, a lovely paper in 2016 by um, Dan Lochran and Arne Schmates, uh, where they made this conjecture about what should happen in general. So <clears throat> we're going to be working with standard vibrations again. Um, uh, it kind of makes sense to assume that the total space has points everywhere locally. Otherwise, this question is not going to be very interesting. And there's this kind of technical assumption, um, which asks that uh, if you pick any of these points in P1 and look at the fiber above it, among the, the components that exist in that fiber, there should be at least one which has multiplicity one, at least one irreducible component of multiplicity one. So that's some sort of technical assumption. And if you have these two assumptions, then this counting function should grow like B squared. So B squared is like the, the total number of rational points in, in in the projective line of height b, uh, but it should die off by uh, log b to this power of uh, this this power of capital delta. So let me define capital delta quickly because it's going to be kind of kind of important. Um, uh, yeah, before doing that, I should say that they they give evidence for this, so they they prove an upper bound which matches this uh, prediction using the large sieve. And there are some lower bounds in the literature, but I have to say, I think that's a much harder problem and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit more patchy. Uh, so what's this delta? So it turns out it's a rational number and this is, this is how you construct it. So you pick a, a point in P1, a closed point in P1, and you look at the, the set. So you look at the fiber above this closed point and you look at all of the uh, sort of irreducible component, absolutely irreducible components of this fiber, which have multiplicity one. Okay, we know that there's at least one of them by by this assumption in the in the conjecture. And then you pick uh, a finite group gamma through which the action of the absolute Galois group on these irreducible components factors, and you define this rational number. So it's, uh, you, it's just the proportion of elements of this uh, subgroup of the Galois group, uh, which act with a fixed point on this set of irreducible components. Okay, and with that to hand, uh, you can now define delta. So delta is just the sum of uh, like one minus delta, and one minus little delta, as you go over all of the closed points of P1. So maybe a couple of comments here. Uh, so firstly, uh, you know, if you have one of these standard vibrations, so one of the assumptions was that the generic fiber is irreducible. So that means that there's only gonna be finitely many D for which the fiber is not irreducible. 
And as soon as the fiber is irreducible, uh, that means that any element of the absolute Galois group is going to act with a fixed point on this set of fibers. There's only one irreducible component in the fiber. So for, you know, for all but finitely many closed points D, this little delta is equal to one, which means that you know, this, this sum over Ds, uh, over closed points D, in the definition of capital delta is really just a finite sum. Uh, maybe I could give an example of its calculation. So let's go back to this Landau example. So if you, uh, so that there are, you know, the fiber is a, uh, is a, is a quadric surface, is a quadratic surface. It's, you know, for most, so it's only going to be uh, reducible when S or T vanish. So when S and T are non-zero, uh, then uh, you, the fiber is irreducible. And so this little delta is equal to one. If S is zero, so that corresponds to the, the, the closed point zero. So if S is zero, um, then, uh, you know, the, the, this fiber is, uh, is, uh, is, you get these two components, uh, which are conjugated under the Gaussians in a quadratic extension. And so therefore, uh, you, you really only have to look at, um, uh, yeah, there's, there's really just this uh, C, C2, Z, Z mod 2Z, which acts uh, on, this, on these fibers. And uh, only one of them is going to fix uh, the component. So this little delta is, uh, is equal to a half. So it's just the identity which is going to fix the, uh, fix the component. And so it's the same for the, the, uh, the closed point at infinity. And so that's telling you that delta is equal to a half plus a half, which is one. So this is, this is, uh, uh, this is consistent. If we just go back to uh, uh, this, this conjecture. So the conjecture is telling us that we should expect for this example, b squared divided by log b. And that's indeed what we, uh, what we saw at the top of the screen. Okay, so I think this is a really nice conjecture. It sort of generated a fair bit of research, um, you know. And, and anytime you you have something like this, you can immediately think about how you might uh, how you might extend it, and um, that's what I want to do today. And I'll just mention a couple of ways that you can extend it. Um, so, firstly, you could try and make some predictions for the leading constant in this asymptotic formula, and that's now been done. This was done last year. Um, so there's some uh, beautiful work of uh, Dan Lockram with uh, Nick Rome and Ephemia Sophos. So firstly, uh, they make a conjecture for the leading constant and they back it up by uh, upgrading um, Sayer's upper bound to an actual asymptotic formula. Um, so they calculate the leading constant here and it's kind of interesting because it has this structure as a product of local densities but there's these other two factors, like the number two and the number pi over three, pi to the three over two, which take a bit of explaining. And then that's what they end up doing in their paper. So I recommend taking a look. Um, you could also uh, ask about moving away from P1 as a base and maybe looking at some higher dimensional things. And I should say that in their paper, Locker and Schmates actually do work with fib vibrations over Pn and you get the same sort of picture arising. Um, but I, this is something that I spent a bit of time with uh, when um, uh, Roman Serapin was in, uh, in, in, in my group, and we looked at an example. So the, the basic question is, you know, what can you say about other vibrations from X down to Y? But now you just assume that Y is some Fano variety. So it's not P1 anymore, but just some variety maybe for which you, you know how to prove Manning's conjecture. So you know how to count the number of rational points of bounded height on the variety. So can you say something about, you know, the number of rational points on your variety of bounded anti-canonical height, uh, such that, you know, the fiber above the point is everywhere locally soluble in this vibration? So it's a, it's a natural enough question. <clears throat> so if you uh, kind of naively uh, conjoined the Manning conjecture and this Lochran schmaitz conjecture, it would suggest that this counting function should grow like, uh, b times some powers of log b. And so you should get log b to the rho minus one. So this is what you would see in the Manning conjecture where rho is the, uh, the rank of the Picard group of y. And Locker and Schmitz would be suggesting that you, 
you know, it decays by this log B to the delta. So delta is this invariant that's associated to uh, um, the the structure of the vibration and the, the behavior of the of the uh, of the fibers. So we were sorry, yes. Yeah, so we explored this in a very particular case. So if we take a split quadric uh, in P three, uh, so this is a smooth uh, Fano variety. Uh, it it's it has higher Picard rank, so it's uh, it has Picard rank two. And we took a particular X. So this was the X that we took. Uh, it lies inside P3 cross P3. And um, it gives you this morphism from X to Y, the fibers of which are all these um, diagonal quadric surfaces. And it turned out that you get something slightly weird happening. So uh, we, as part of this summer project, we calculated that delta for this problem is two. Uh, but the counting function is bounded above, well, basically has order of magnitude B. Um, so I, yeah, so just to point out that the expected exponent of log B according to that uh, conjunction of conjectures on the previous slide is uh, rho minus one minus delta. So uh, as we saw, delta is two. So we were expecting to see uh, like um, B divided by log B uh, for this, uh, for this counting function. So that's kind of slightly surprising to us. Uh, I've, we've looked at it a little bit and it seems like um, there might be some thin sets inside Y, uh, thin sets of rational points inside the rational points on Y, uh, which uh, if you remove them, uh, you, you, you would get an asymptotic formula, which is a little bit more in keeping with uh, the expectation we had on the previous slide. Uh, so I think there's some forthcoming work in the pipeline here of, uh, of Cameron Wilson, a PhD student of uh, Athenios Sophos, uh, who's been studying this. And I think that's the sort of um, co-thin set that you need to take in order to make, to make things work. Okay, um, well, that's, that was two ways in which you could think about generalizing this conjecture or extending the conjecture. The one that I want to focus on actually, uh, and the one that this uh, preprint on the archive is about, is this technical condition that they had in the conjecture. So they had this, this um, condition that um, above every closed point, um, there should exist at least one irreducible component which has multiplicity one. So what happens if you drop that condition? Um, yeah, so that's what I've written there. Um, well, it, it turns out that it has a very, it seems to have a very strong effect, a very strong effect indeed. And uh, in some sense, our paper is uh, trying to make uh, more quantitative uh, an observation of uh, Collier, Tolen, Skorobogatov, and Swinnerton and Dyer in the late 90s. Um, so they uh, played around with these situations where you have vibrations with multiple fibers. And they wrote down a number of examples. This is one of them. So you take uh, basically a standard vibration that is built from taking a you know, proper model of this affine variety. And so uh, T is uh, the variable for you know, the affine line. And so C and D and F, they're polynomials uh, with uh, coefficients in the rational numbers. Um, and you can see that you know, for fixed T, uh, this is an intersection of two quadrics. And if you sort of think of it projectively, it's an intersection of two quadrics in, uh, in, in P3. So it's a genus one curve. So this is a, this is a, uh, uh, a vibration uh, in, uh, whose fibers are all um, genus one curves. So it's a bit more complicated than the examples that we were looking at before where we had uh, uh, conic vibrations or quadric surface vibrations we have um, higher genus curve vibrations. What they actually proved was, well, two things. So firstly, they, they proved geometrically that uh, you get double fibers occurring above the roots of F inside X. So this is a, you know, an explicit example where um, double fibers actually occur. And moreover, so what they actually proved was that uh, there are only finitely many integer points 
inside P1 in, in this situation that, sorry, in the situation that the, the degree of this polynomial F is at least six, then they showed that uh, basically the rational points upstairs, um, the image of the rational points upstairs uh, lie in, you know, uh, finitely many points uh, downstairs. So that uh, is, well, sorry, yes. And I should point out that, um, <clears throat> in fact, something stronger follows from their argument. This was something observed by uh, Lochran and uh, Lillian Matteson was in fact, even this local solubility counting function uh, is finite. Uh, so that whatever the value of B, there's only finitely many um, elements uh, of P1, which lie in the image of uh, idyllic points on the total space. Provided that the degree of F is at least six, I think there's some conditions on C, D and F as well. I think F needs to be uh, even degree and square free um, and maybe co-prime to C minus D, something like that. So, uh, yeah, so that technical condition that they had in their conjecture, it, it might have seemed somewhat strange, but if you remove it, uh, you get drastically different behavior. And that's what, this, that's, that's what we're seeing here. And uh, yeah, that's what we wanted to do was to try and uh, investigate this a bit further and, and um, put it on a more quantitative um, footing. Um, yeah, so maybe I should, I mean, one of the things that uh, we, we struggled with in this, I mean, it's, it's always nice to have uh, sufficiently explicit examples so that you can kind of see what's going on. Like in, in the Landau example, we, we could very easily see the, the kind of multiplicative constraints that were placed on uh, S and T in order that the fiber is everywhere locally soluble. And it would be nice to have some examples in this setting too, but it turns out that it's, that, I don't know, there aren't very you know, there aren't the same kind of conic bundle type examples in this world. Um, so there's a famous theorem of Graeber, Harris, and Starr, which implies here that uh, as soon as you have double fibers or multiple fibers, uh, the generic fiber cannot be rationally connected. So in particular, it cannot be rational. So in particular, it cannot be a conic or a quadric. So they are necessarily more complicated, like this. Uh, so yeah, so having these. <coughs> These fibers that are higher genus curves is, is the norm in this world. And it can be a little harder to see, see what's going on explicitly. Um, so, so here we closely follow some ideas of uh, some very influential ideas of uh, Frederick Campana. Um, it, was a, it was a geometer, but explored this kind of question arithmetically as well. So if you have a standard vibration, uh, you can associate an orbifold to it. And the way you do that, so an orbifold is just uh, a pair of a, a curve and a Q divisor. So here we're having a, uh, a curve is just P1. And we build this Q divisor uh, in, a, in a specific way. So for each closed point in P1, we just write down uh, M, M sub D. So it's a positive integer. And it's just gonna be the minimum multiplicity that happens in the fibers. So above D, you've got a bunch of uh, components, irreducible components. Uh, some of them are, uh, are going to be, uh, sometimes there's not going to be any multiple fibers, in which case you take MD to be one. Sometimes uh, there are going to be multiple fibers um, and you just take MD to be the minimum multiplicity that occurs in these fibers. And then you just define this uh, slightly strange looking <coughs> Q divisor. Uh, uh, d sub pi by taking a sum over these closed points of one minus one over m uh, as, a, as, a, as a coefficient of that divisor of, of that closed point. So again, uh, <clears throat> generically, uh, these things that the fibers are absolutely irreducible. So generically, that means md is going to be one. So again, this looks like it's an infinite sum, but really it's just a finite sum. Good, um, and then the, the basic key idea, which again goes, goes back to Campana really, is this idea that we can interpret this local counting function, uh, sorry, local solubility counting function as a problem about counting Campana points on this orbifold. Okay, so that the topic, uh, so independently of this story, the topic of counting Campana points on orbifolds 
has uh, has, has sort of re received increased interest and attention over the, the, the last few years. Um, it's sort of a world where it kind of lies in between the world of rational points uh, and the world of integral points, which I think everyone agrees are too difficult. Um, but Campana points are still expected to exhibit the same sorts of things, properties and behaviors that you would see in the world of rational points, like, um, you know, a, a Manning type conjecture, some uh, kind of analog of Brown Manning obstructions and, and all of this stuff. And in fact, there's a, there's a nice paper by uh, Piripan, Smeets, Tanimoto, and Marilyn Alvarado, where they phrase uh, uh, or they articulate what a version of the Manning conjecture would look like uh, for counting these Campana points of bounded height for, for much more general things than P1 and this divisor, really just for in, in a much more general setting. So anyway, there, there is that that story, which is uh, which I think is uh, is which is important. But what's in, what's going to be key here is that yes, we we certainly need to be counting Campana points, but in order to really detect this local solubility business, we are also having to throw in some extra conditions, some extra multiplicative constraints, which are going to come from uh, some kind of uh, application of the Chebotarov theorem. Um, so. With that in mind, so there, these are associated to any of these vibrations, we can associate this orbifold base. Um, and then we have this, this is the first conjecture. So uh, if you assume that the, uh, that the this divisor that I've written there is ample, uh, then this counting function should grow at most like B to the two minus the degree of del uh, D, plus epsilon. Um, so actually the, the condition that uh, minus kp1 plus d is ample is equivalent to uh, two minus the degree of uh, d uh, being positive. So it's equivalent to that exponent being positive. Um, so th this kind of general topic actually uh, goes back uh, or, or like this sort of bounding points on, Campana points on varieties, goes back to a, a beautiful talk by uh, Bjorn Poonen in 2006, which I remember seeing at the, um, uh, there was an MSRI program. And it, this pertains to a particular base. Uh, so you take the projected line and you just take three, uh, three, uh, three divisors above which you have some higher multiplicity. Uh, so you take a half, uh, times uh, the close point zero, half times close point one, and uh, half times the, the point of infinity. And when you unravel the definition of, you know, Campana points, you know, what's the, what, what is a Campana point? What's, the, what's a rational point in this setting? Um, it just turns into this very charming uh, and concrete problem, uh, which is asking about counting positive integers, A, B, C, in some range. They have to be square full. So if you know if a prime divides A, then P squared should also divide A. And they uh, they satisfy this uh, linear equation, A plus B is equal to C. <clears throat> so Bjorn was popularizing this back in 2006. And I think we, st we still don't know how to solve it, sadly. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, the, the sort of prediction for the exponent uh, is uh, two minus the this degree of this divisor, which is three over two. So the expected exponent is a half. So we're really kind of expecting that this counting function grows like b to the half. Uh, you can think of this different, I mean, uh, square full numbers have the same approximate density as squares. Uh, and we know how to handle this problem for squares. That's just counting Pythagorean triples. Uh, so certainly b to the half is a reasonable thing to believe in, in this setting. Uh, I think the current record is still b to the three fifths plus epsilon, so we're not even able to handle this, uh, this very simple looking problem. Um, however, what we'll see is that it is much easier to handle problems when you have uh, just two divisors, sorry, yeah, two closed points above which there's some higher multiplicity. This, this problem of three, uh, uh, three uh, multiple points uh, is, is um, uh, much more challenging. Yeah, so anyway, I want to try and, in, you know, the motivation in, in this conjecture, well, the motivation next is to try and make this conjecture 
a bit more explicit, you know, is this epsilon uh, occluding some explicit power of a logarithm and, and what is it? Uh, so the first ingredient that we, we had to um, uh, sort of develop in this setting uh, was a sort of more a sort of general criterion for testing local solubility. So um, if we uh, pick a point in P1, a rational point in P1, and we take a sufficiently large prime P where <clears throat> sufficiently large is, is just relative to the, the data of this vibration. And we suppose that the, you know, the, the fiber above that point uh, has piadic points. Okay, so what can we say then about X? Is there some condition on X that we can write down? <clears throat> well, this is the condition that comes out of the, the uh, out of the work. So if you pick any closed point uh, above P1, and you know, a closed point in P1 is basically the same thing as a binary form, H. So this closed point we're thinking of as a, a zero set of a binary form. Then there are two possibilities. So either um, the piadic valuation of uh, H, this binary form, evaluated at this point X is bigger than MD, or it's equal to MD, but then you get this extra information that uh, the Frobenius element at P has to fix uh, one of these components um, in, the, in the fiber. So this is a slightly different Time. This is a slightly different uh, set to the one I defined before. Uh, it's very similar, but we are, you know, above this closed point D. We're looking at all of the geometrically irreducible components, but we're only going to look at those which actually have multiplicity equal to this minimal multiplicity in M sub D. Tim, there's a question in the chat. Sean, oh, we maybe you want to unmute and just ask away directly. Yeah, uh, on the previous slide. Could you show the previous slide? Sorry. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, you mentioned that you were. To, are you counting uh, Campana points or this n log pi b? Where does it count? Yeah. Well, that that that's literally the definition I gave before, which is counting points in P one, uh, which uh, which lie in the image of adelic points. So there are no question. There's no question of Campana points at that point. Not there isn't a question of Campana points at that point, but uh, it follow is going to follow from this sparsity criterion that I was just describing that you you are basically reduced to counting Campana points on the on the top on the on the total space on P one on P one on P one okay 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 thank you yep thank you thank you for the question yeah so that's uh, well that's kind of what you can see here so uh, I guess. You know, if uh, to to illustrate this, if if we uh, if we were looking at the the closed point uh, above, you know, the closed point at zero, so uh, the uh, the point zero comma one, then the the binary form is just x naught, and uh, you can sort of see that it's saying that, well, for basically that uh, at least at sufficient with respect to sufficiently large primes, uh, x naught has to be M naught full. And you know, if the prime divides X naught uh, exactly to the nth power, then you get this extra information that this Frobenius element fixes one of the uh, irreducible components in the fiber. Yeah. So it uh, yeah, it, it's basically telling you that you are reduced to a Campana point on P1, but you have this extra uh, kind of uh, Frobenian condition. Good. Uh, so let me say a little bit about what happens for one fiber, one multiple fiber, because that's a little easier to see what's going on. And, and we prove an upper bound. So uh, we, we sort of refine that uh, epsilon. You get b to the 2 minus this expected exponent. And then you get the same log b that occurs in this lochran schmaitz conjecture. So here, I'm, I'm really just taking the, uh, <clears throat> uh, assuming that there's one multiple fiber at the origin, uh, sorry, at zero. So uh, yeah, just rapidly, I guess I already kind of discussed this. So the sparsity criterion tells us that we're just counting now uh, pairs of integers, which are co-prime, uh, which lie in a box. And I get that X naught, so the first integer has to be M naught full. 
And for any of the other divisors that occur in this, uh, in this vibration, um, this binary form H evaluated at this integer, X naught, X one, should lie in this multiplicative span of the primes that split in some appropriate extension associated to the divisor. So that's just what that notation means. I just, I just mean that any prime dividing this, uh, this binary form evaluated at X naught and X one uh, should, you know, should be a Frobenian prime for some predetermined Frobenian set of primes. And uh, yeah, it turns out that this is something that you can also use the large sieve uh, to estimate. Um, good. So here's another example. Um, uh, so these are the Halfen surfaces, are sort of a nice family of surfaces. I think they were introduced in the late 19th century um, as <clears throat> I think they're classes of uh, surfaces uh, which uh, admit vibrations to P1, the fibers of which are genus one curves. And I think they, so they're elliptic vibrations, but they, they are actually all rational. So they're kind of a very special class. Uh, so I'm going to assume that there's a triple fiber now above the, the point, uh, at the close point at zero. And I'm also going to assume that above uh, the point one I, uh, there's a reducible fiber. But I'm going to assume that it's split by a cyclic cubic extension. So I just mean that, uh, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, um, yeah, it, it's uh, sorry, it's um, it's it's not geometrically irreducible, uh, and uh, it, but if you work over this psychic cubic extension, then all of the components are defined over it. Um, so again, if you go through that sparsity criterion, um, you get a similar kind of conclusion. So firstly, x naught, uh, uh, yeah. So now, I, yeah, sorry the. Uh, I think when I mentioned the sparsity criterion, I just mentioned a necessary condition, but you can also, so part of the work was to uh, get a necessary and sufficient condition under, under suitable assumptions. And that, that takes a bit of work. Uh, it's a bit above my pay grade. It uses sort of log geometry and things like that. Um, but you can use it here to, uh, to actually determine that X naught is not just cube full, but actually a cube. And uh, the, you know, the, the binary form associated to this closed point is just the, the sum of two squares. So we're asking that x naught is a cube and that x naught squared plus x one squared <clears throat> lies in the multiplicative span of primes that split in this cyclic cubic extension. But that's a problem we saw before, right at the start. So that was one of these sieve problems that I was trying to um, advertise. And this was solved for us by, um, by Friedlander and Evangelitz. And you get upper and lower bounds, which, uh, which, which are matching. <clears throat> but yeah, it'd be nice to have more success stories with the sieve, which could then be used to um, investigate this particular problem. So I'm on my last slide. Um, I just wanted to, uh, yeah, so just mention, it's very natural to, uh, to think, of, to try and think about this epsilon when you, when you have uh, more than one multiple fiber. So yeah, let me just go back. So when we had one multiple fiber, uh, we were able to prove this upper bound and you know it was a kind of a predictable upper bound. It was uh, kind of B to this exponent, which can be less than, less than two. And we've got the familiar <clears throat> exponent of log B in the denominator, just as we saw in the Lockerenschmidt's uh, work. Uh, but I, yeah, it, but it turns out that if you have more than one fiber, that all goes out the window and we sort of get this kind of slightly surprising and uh, crazy looking conjecture. So uh, we are going to assume again that we've got the standard vibration, um, that the, uh, the, the, the relevant divisor is ample. Uh, obviously, uh, it makes sense to assume that the total space is, uh, <clears throat> is everywhere locally soluble. I haven't defined all of these terms. They are, you know, if this piques your interest, you can look in the paper. Um, but we basically construct uh, a, a morphism, an old form morphism, and 
the conjecture is that this exists um, and it has the structure of a G torsor, a finite tail group scheme G. And um, actually this counting function uh, should grow like, uh, it's the same thing on the top, so B to this, uh, this, this exponent, two minus the degree of the, uh, the divisor. But on the, on the bottom, you get something slightly wild. You get like uh, an exponent of log B, which is a minimum of all of these different rational numbers, uh, capital delta, associated to diff different element, different sort of twists, uh, V in this, uh, parameterized by this H1. Uh, so yeah, the, these, uh, if you, so the Vs parameterize these twists of this morphism and uh, the pi V that occurs in that, uh, that, that exponent. <clears throat> is uh, is a standard morphism you get by uh, normalizing uh, the pullback of this morphism pi along along this twist. Okay, so I'm not going to go into this in any detail whatsoever. Uh, I just wanted to make a couple of comments verbally. Um, so if it turns out that if you are in the situation that there are uh, no multiple fi no multiple fibers occurring, um, this uh, immediately recovers uh, the original locker and schmates conjecture. If there's one multiple fiber occurring, um, then it turns out that uh, this orbifold is simply connected. Uh, and so this H1 is trivial. And you, uh, you, you actually just collapse down to the, 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 the exponent that, they were, that, that we saw, uh, sorry, on the previous slides, so just the delta of pi. Um, and we, I guess in the paper, we, we try and prove some evidence for this slightly weird looking thing. And we, we prove an upper bound, which matches this uh, when you have uh, two multiple fibers over, over zero and over infinity. And we also provided an example which shows that uh, you definitely need to take something smaller than, you know, what the Lochran Schmates analog uh, would suggest. So you, you definitely need to take uh, this, it seems like you need to take this minimum. So we, we proved and we provided an example which shows that this is uh, correct and different from the kind of naive analog of the Locker and Schmitt's uh, conjecture would, uh, would, would suggest. Um, good, thanks very much for your attention. <laughs>